A gentleman by the name of Theodore Milan, if you're really, really interested, you might want to read a book he wrote called Disorders of Personality, DSM-5 and Beyond. And he wrote this, oh gosh, mid-90s, probably 95. And while they're not listed in the DSM, he actually worked with people putting the DSM together. And he said there were four subtypes. One was discouraged or quiet. These are real clingy, passive, borderline personality types, and they're real prone to self-mutilation, suicide, feelings of emptiness. They have an intolerance of being alone. So they're clingy and passive, and they may cut or burn themselves a lot. And then there's the impulsive type. These are the energetic, charismatic types. I mean, they come on really strong, but they can just as quickly become cold and hostile. They're easily bored, so they start taking high-risk behaviors, and they're prone to self-mutilation, suicide. They're very resistant to treatment. Then there's the petulant. They're angry. They feel unworthy. They're very possessive. They don't let you out of their sight. This is where you see a lot of eating disorders, a lot of drug addiction. And then there's just the straight-up self-destructive. These people are marked by bitterness, self-hatred. I mean, they just really turn this anger inward. And the self-hatred can take all kinds of forms. They're attention seekers. They show off a lot. So you're going to see them reckless driving, maybe get into drugs, promiscuity, eating disorders of some type. If you're thinking about the nine, it only takes five. And then your person that you're thinking about, whether it's yourself or somebody else, you might think further as to whether or not you fit in one of those four categories that are more descriptive, discouraged or quiet, impulsive, petulant, or self-destructive. Now, why do people get this way? Well, I'm sorry to tell you we don't really know. There's probably some kind of biological vulnerability that could be genetic or it could be some other kind of composition in your biology. And they typically have in their past some kind of invalidating environment. Somewhere along the line, they've been abused, beaten, molested, where who they thought they were or who they wanted to be or become has been taken away from them. So if you look back into their histories, there is some kind of biological predisposition in some way a lot of the time. But then also, the way they've been raised, the way they've grown up, they've been told, you don't matter. I don't see you. I don't hear you. So they lose their self-image. They lose their self-worth. They have identity disturbance because they've been told they don't matter. They're just not on the priority list. It just doesn't matter. Now, that's pretty vague. But If you've got it in your family, you're at higher risk for having it yourself. And if you've been through an environment that didn't teach you to value yourself, and in fact taught you not to value yourself, then you're probably more likely to experience this than anyone else. So is it treatable? Some research says that as high as 84% of the people with borderline personality disorder, respond positively to treatment. I'm not saying that they cure it or they completely get over it, but they do respond positively to treatment. So there is hope. 
And there is a particular treatment that we'll talk about in the future called dialectical behavior therapy. It's an evidence-based therapy that's been shown to create good results with these people, more so than a lot of other things. And we'll talk about that in the future. Now, if you're living with one of these people, there are a lot of do's and don'ts. There are a lot of strategies that you can have. And that's what we're going to talk about next time is, okay, if I have spotted one of these people, okay, Dr. Phil, you finally put a name to it. You've identified for me what it is I'm dealing with here because I've been wondering, what the hell? This person, it seems like no matter what I do, it just doesn't matter. They just go off. Well, now you may know why. They may be borderline personality. And if that's true, how are you ever going to get them to treatment? Well, let me give you one clue in closing here. You want to talk to people about what they deserve, not what they need. People don't like it when you step up to them and say, you know what you need to do? You need to get some help. You need to go see a therapist. You need to get somebody that will sit down and help you work this out. That sounds very judgmental. And for a borderline personality disorder, it sounds like a way to abandon them. It sounds judgmental, and it's likely to trigger resistance and rage. But it sure as hell sounds like, get away from me, you're sick, you're broken, you're wounded. And they're going to turn that into something that plays right into their fear of abandonment, and it's going to further complicate their disrupted identity. If, on the other hand, you approach them by saying, I notice that you're anxious a lot, or I notice that you really seem to be depressed and unhappy. And I just want to tell you, I love you, and I think you deserve to get that out of your life. I think you deserve better than that. And I think you deserve to give yourself whatever it takes for that to not be part of your life anymore. I just know you, and I think you deserve it. So, I mean, let's talk about what can be done. I mean, what do you deserve? Now, does that mean they're going to run and jump into a dialectical behavior therapist arms? Not necessarily, but you're going to have a lot better success talking to them about what they deserve instead of judgmentally telling them what they need. And even if you're not doing it judgmentally, there's a good chance that's how they're going to hear it. So I'm just saying, take out the word need from your vocabulary and put in the word deserve and see if you maybe get less pushback that way. See if you come across less judgmental and less preachy. I don't know. Maybe you will. Maybe it'll be more successful for you. Okay. Now, we've been talking about borderline personality. And as I say, I'm telling you all of this because I want you to recognize what you're dealing with. 50% of the solution to any problem lies in defining it. And I think if you know why you are the way you are, or why somebody else is the way they are, it's much easier to deal with it. Maybe I'm describing someone in your life here. Maybe I'm describing you. And if I'm describing you, don't stigmatize yourself. There's nothing to be ashamed of here. I mean, this is a tough situation, and you deserve. I've just told you my strategy, and now I'm doing it with you. You deserve to have some help with it. And, you know, the reason that that works is because it's true. 
Yeah, I've been fighting stigma in mental illness for 45 years. I absolutely hate that people deny themselves help because there's a stigma attached. If they admit they have a mental illness, if they admit they have a personality disorder or something that needs treatment, it's like they've admitted a flaw, a fallacy, a weakness. Well, we all have flaws, fallacies, and weaknesses, and that's okay. And human beings are supposed to be joyful and rejoice in the Spirit. So when I say I think you deserve to be set free from this, I really mean it. And there's help available, and it does help. You can be helped with this. You can live a happier, more peaceful life. So I'm saying, yeah, you deserve it. And everybody around you deserves it too. They deserve to have all of you instead of just the part that comes through the anxiety. And it helps a lot. Instead of telling somebody, I think you have borderline personality disorder. To just talk about the obvious, if they're depressed or they're anxious, start with that. Let the therapist work it out. If they're good, they'll get to the borderline part. They'll get to that. Just talk to them that they deserve some help with their depression or their anxiety. Something that's comorbid with the borderline personality disorder. 